We are Christina, Oneida, Alicia, Colleen. Welcome to 4NP's podcast. This is a podcast by 4NP's, 4NP's advanced practice nurses, students, and anyone interested in the medical arts. That's the number 4NPS podcast. If you have a topic you'd like to see covered, please feel free to email us at 4NP's podcast at gmail.com or reach out to us through our social media. Hi, friends. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the 4NP's podcast. On this episode, we had the pleasure of speaking with Donna Cardillo. Donna Cardillo is known as the Inspiration Nurse. She's a powerhouse of energy, wisdom, and humor who's been referred to as a positive force of nature who lights a path for others to follow. She is the original Dear Donna columnist at Nurse.com. Her accomplished career combines over 25 years of clinical, managerial, and business experience, not to mention her stint as a professional singer. Donna is the author of four books, including the award-winning Falling Together, How to Balance, Joy, and Meaningful Change When Your Life Seems to Be Falling Apart. She's a certified meditation teacher, labyrinth facilitator, Reiki master, and certified forest therapy guide. Donna is a lifelong Jersey girl with attitude and chutzpah to spare. This conversation was very meaningful for the four of us, and we are very excited to share it with all of you, and we hope that you find it as inspirational as we did. Enjoy. Donna, welcome. So We're so happy to have you here with us today. You are a guru. Um, I've been following you for quite some time myself, and, and um, can you just please tell our listeners a little bit about your amazing path in nursing, like what brought you to nursing, and how'd yeah. you get where you are? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I was always interested in science and loved helping people, so I was toying with some things in healthcare, like, you know, lab technology, nursing and whatever. But I was also a volunteer in a hospital when I was in a, in high school. And that just uh, really, really sold me on the, the hospital and the whole environment. And I knew that was something I definitely wanted to do. So I went to a diploma school of nursing quite a few decades ago when that was kind of a popular way to get your nursing education. And like many nurses, I envisioned myself working in the hospital because that's more or less what we were educated and trained to do back then. And I really didn't know about uh, any other options, quite honestly, even though there there have always been a lot of options. I started out working in the emergency room and psych facilities and units because I was very interested in both of those specialties and certainly very um, interrelated. And at some point in time, I didn't leave the hospital because I didn't wanna work at the hospital anymore. I had moved to a different part of my home state of New Jersey. And I looked for another job in a local emergency room at that time, but I couldn't find a shift that I wanted. And so I started to look at other things that might be available to me and looked at ads around for jobs and I saw an ad for a medical weight control center. And that was the first job that I had outside of the traditional hospital role. And uh, I thought it was you know, interesting. It was a different type of environment. While I was there, I actually started out as a head nurse. I ultimately became the center manager. But in that position, I began to understand that I had all these great transferable skills as a registered nurse. And I also began to learn that there was a a big wide world of opportunities for nurses out there. So the more I got out there, the more I learned about my own capabilities and how valuable a registered nurse was in so many different environments. And I also began to learn more about different opportunities. So from the medical weight control center, and by the way, I did lose a little weight while I worked there, but I think I gained (laughs) it all back after I left like many of our clients. Um, After that, I went on to work for a company that did medical exams for insurance companies. Again, answered an ad, didn't really know a lot what it was about, but it suited my schedule and my geography at the time. And, you know, an interesting thing to note, I'll just interject this right now. Sometimes when you take a position, you don't you kind of see what's there on face value and you say, oh, okay, this is, you know, my job description, what I'll be doing, but you really never know what it, what is in store for you with that company Mm -hmm. in that specialty. 
even in that role, and while I was in that role, the DRG system, and for those that don't, aren't familiar with that, diagnostic related groups, the DRG system, which was a revolutionary new way of, for hospitals to bill, was introduced while I was in that position with this company that oh, wow. did medical exams mm -hmm. for insurance companies. And they said, hey, let's um, you know, can we train you in this new thing and send you to hospitals and look at bills? And I thought, sure, not because I saw it as a great career opportunity. I really had no idea what it was, but I thought anything oh, wow. to get out of the office for a couple of hours. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, that amazing training and experience I got in this new healthcare reimbursement system wound up being such a, a pivotal opportunity for me in my career, because after that position, I was hired by a hospital to be director of DRG services, very fancy title, in charge of hospital-wide quality improvement, utilization review, um, and risk management. And I was one of the first DRG coordinators in the country. Wow. So again, important to note that, you know, you take a job and you can see what's there, but you really never know what else is in store. That's why it's, it's, it's good to uh, take a chance sometime and just see what where something leads you. And listen, nobody stays in the same job for their whole career anymore, like some nurses used to. So right. um, anything you decide to go after, uh, that's not going to be the end of the road. And like I said, you never know where it leads. Um, from there, I went on to work for, for a while, I worked for a test prep company, a company that had programs to help uh, help nurses to pass their nursing boards. That was an interesting position for me. And I also worked for a health maintenance organization because managed care was getting big for a while. I wanted to be in on that. Uh, so lots of interesting experiences. And then 27 years ago, I decided to start my own business. I started an education business. And initially, I started to do, and this was my original vision, I wanted to do public seminars for nurses to teach them about all the non-traditional career opportunities that are out there, because I was, the more I learned that was out there, the more I discovered that the average nurse really was not aware of even yeah. some of the more common opportunities that were available to them. In fact, nurses used to say, whoa, well, I hurt my shoulder. That's it. I can't work in nursing anymore. I'll have to get a real mm. estate license. Not oh, wow. knowing <laughs> that there were just so many different ways and places to, um, to work as a nurse. So I um, started to do seminars called Career Alternatives for Nurses, and not only to teach nurses what was available, but to teach them how to market themselves and advocate for themselves as well, uh, writing a, a dynamite resume, having a great online presence, interviewing, all of that, but just really opening up a whole wide world for them and even teaching nurses about the transferable skills that they had because so many of us had, had such a narrow view of who a nurse is and what a nurse does still today, even absolutely. Yeah. A lot of, yeah, a lot of new nurses come out of nursing school with that very narrow view. Um, I have a very broad view of who a nurse is and what a nurse does. And I know now that if the opportunity isn't already to be found somewhere, then we can create it and do it because we are vital and needed in every aspect on the planet, everything in and out of healthcare. Yeah, so true. It's so true. We find the same thing um, with you know our our podcast is geared towards nurse practitioners, but we also in, we include the RNs. We include this. We're all RNs. So um, sure. and then uh, and the students because we we really found that that was lacking. We found it was lacking when we graduated as RNs, and we found it was lacking when we graduated as NPs. And there really is so much out there. There's so many opportunities. Um, and I just, I love your positive, um, outlook. I love the way that you are, um, you kind of roll with the changes. You, it sounds like you go into a job and you're like, you know what, uh, this is suiting me or this isn't suiting me. And, uh, you're, you're growing it yourself. You're driving it too, which is such a wonderful, uh, energy to bring. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. And I, and I want to be clear. I didn't have this big elaborate plan for my career years ago. I mean, every job that I had honestly was not ever anything I could have anticipated or planned for because most of the jobs I had, most of the positions I had after the hospital were things that I didn't even know existed until I actually was in that arena or in that environment. So that's important to know. Yeah. And would you say that you kept, um, your schedule seemed to be the determining factor for which jobs 
Some, so, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. And that, you know, sometimes we choose a position based on our schedule or like I said, geography, you know, there was one time when I needed something close to home because I had an old car and uh, didn't know how long it would last. And my financial situation wasn't such that I could just go out and buy another car. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were times that I did that, but other times I was interested in the challenge of something. When I took a position with an insurance company um, working, I was the director of health services there uh, that was a, that was a lot to do with the DRG stuff and and w- all kinds of stuff going on. That was a position I was interested in because I wanted to learn about managed care. I thought if I get on the inside, that is that will be an incredible learning opportunity for me when managed care was exploding. And it was an incredible learning opportunity. It really helped me. It even helps me navigate my way through my my own and my family's insurance today too. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I can see Donna why you're, you know, um, why you've written so many great books because you are, you don't allow your situation, I guess, to hold you back. I mean, you, you seek out um, innovative ways to make it work. Um, and, and that's just very commendable, but are you able to tell us a little bit about the books you've written and, and even some of the programs you've, you've collaborated with, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've written four books to date. Fifth one rolling around in my mind as we speak. Uh, The first book I wrote was called Your First Year as a Nurse, Making the Transition from Total Novice to Successful Professional. And I wrote that book because uh, in the late, I started my business in 1995. In the late 1990s, I was getting calls from a lot of new nurses who were saying, "Um, I'm not cut out for this. I can't do this. It's not what I expected. What else can I do Mm. out there? So rather than Mm. telling them what else they could do out there, I said, okay, well, let's talk about what's going on with you right now. What's, you know, describe to me what's happening, what you're feeling. And what they described was what every new registered nurse goes through. It was that that culture shock of suddenly being out of (laughs) nursing school and under the protective wing of your instructor and suddenly being a licensed registered nurse and and being given the keys to the narcotics and and, and whatever (laughs) else out there. So um, they were shocked to hear that their experience and their feelings were totally normal. And so I thought, you know, um, there's so much, so much that we need to learn about being a new nurse, being a nurse that we, we don't get in nursing school, not because nursing educators don't teach it because they have to cram so much into the limited time that they have with us as students to teach us the basics that we need for entry to practice, but to give us what we need to pass NCLEX RN. That's, that's what they're doing. That's, their, that's what they need to do for us. Mm-hmm. And so I say that that book is all the things that you need to know to be successful in nursing that they don't have time to teach you in nursing school. And um, so I talk about things like assimilating into your new unit, becoming part of the team, uh, speaking to physicians, communicating with physicians. That's a big thing. That's a big stressor Mm -hmm. for new nurses. Conflict management, staying positive and upbeat when things aren't going well, overcoming fear, all of those other things that are so important and really how to how to get off on the right foot with your professional life too by joining and getting active in professional associations and uh, so on all of all of those things so that book fortunately was um, wildly successful still is today it's used by many um, healthcare organizations and universities across the country many hospitals use it in their nurse residency program for oh, wow. their new nurse orientees, et cetera. Wow. So it was published by Penguin Random House. And about 10 years after that first, it was also um, translated into Korean. And oh, wow. after, that, <laughs> after that first edition came out, uh, the, the publisher approached me because the book books usually, you know, they sell, they sell well, and then they start to fizzle out. So the book was still selling well 10 years later. So they contacted me and asked if I'd be willing oh to do a second edition. And I said, hell yes. That's That's awesome. So yeah, really nice to be asked. So I updated the book. And then again, 10 years later now, they asked if I would write a third edition. And the this the third edition just was just released on May the 10th. I was thrilled that it came out during Nurses Week. Um, I had to do a lot of revisions because some of the material was originally written 20 years ago. So everything Mm -hmm. just had to be updated, refreshed. 
And I had to add three new chapters. When you do a book revision, it depends on the publisher, but they usually want you to not just update it, they want you to add new material. So I put three new chapters in. Uh, I put in a chapter on um, it, the empowered nurse. So assertiveness and learning about yourself, finding your voice, standing up for yourself, all of those things. Uh, mindfulness and practice, because mindfulness is an important part of any nursing practice and uh, mm -hmm. a whole chapter on resilience as well. And resilience um, became a little bit of a dirty word in nursing during the pandemic because it was misunderstood and it was people were being told to be resilient without explaining what it meant or being given any tools. Resilience is not pushing yourself to burnout. Resilience is really developing a strong inner core that is gonna help you stand up to the really tough times that we encounter in life personally mm -hmm. and professionally, but then yeah. also be able to recover and to come back <laughs> even stronger. So I thought those were all really important things for new nurses to know in addition to what was there. And I wanted to interview a lot of, I always interview a lot of new nurses when I revise the book, but I wanted to talk to new nurses who had started their practice during the pandemic. And was that an incredibly wow. eye-opening experience for me? Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine starting your practice in today's, today's environment. It's not yeah. like it was when I got started in nursing. Everything is so acute and so quick today and rapid fire and, and multi-system issues and older. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine yeah. um, that's hard enough, but starting in the middle of a pandemic and, and total chaos but I have to tell you, I was very inspired and heartwarmed by the stories I heard of how these new nurses managed in absolutely impossible circumstances in those early days, particularly, and how they persevered, how they did what they had to do, and how many of them are still there. They're still plugging along in the clinical environment. They didn't say, holy, good Lord, this is way too hard. Mm -hmm. I just can't do this. So they somehow got through it like most nurses did, even very seasoned ones, mm -hmm. and they're still there plugging along for the most part. So um, I just really, you know, I sometimes hear nurses talk about, talk disparagingly about new nurses and how they're not this or they don't have that. But I got to tell you, the new nurses that I talk to, I just have such wonderful faith in the future of our profession because of the new people that are coming in that I talk to and interact with on, a, on an almost daily basis. That's wonderful to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So my second book was called The Ultimate Career Guide for <laughs> Nurses, and it's strategies for, um, for being successful and really for thriving in your career. And that's all about professional development. That's for any nurse to be successful from student through retirement and beyond. And then um, that's published by the American Nurses Association. And uh, my third book was a day book for beginning nurses, which is an inspirational journal type format for new nurses, but really for anybody that's published by Sigma Theta Tau. And then my oh. fourth book is called Falling Together, which is the opposite of falling apart. Falling <laughs> Together, um, how to find balance, joy, and meaningful change when your life seems to be falling apart. And that book, if I had to sum it up in a word, it's about resilience. But I tell some of my own stories, not because I think people want to hear about my life, but you can read some of about some of the challenges that I've had that I still have in my life. You may not have had my experiences, but hopefully you, the reader, can glean lessons from my experiences and apply it to your own life. And to know that everybody at every stage of life um, is face, faces big challenges at some point, but there's ways to um, work through them. Yeah. Yeah, we could all use a little bit of that. Yeah, <laughs> who can't? We all do. Oh. Yes, yeah, certainly you're an inspiration, Donna. I just, Thank I love you. what you were saying about um, just having that resilience. And I think it's something uh, all of us, we you learn how to do that initially. You don't know that you have it, but there's that little part in you. And as you have to use it during things like a pandemic and things that, you know, challenges, you know, change of career, whatever, those things kind of get built upon. I mean, mm -hmm. nursing is such a journey. We've all kind of been on that journey and we, we each build upon each experience 
in learning, but um, I was looking at one of your, I can't remember what social media platform you were on at the time, but you had a a short little blurb and it was called The Power of Transformation Mm. and how nurses embrace, how you have to learn how to embrace change, Mm -hmm. evolve and adapt and grow in nursing, um, you know, to tackle and and become more more resilient. Um, Can you speak a little bit more about um, how nurses can build that power of transformation and and just learn to embrace adaptation uh, yeah, in their absolutely. personal life and career. So, so the reality of life is that a change is going to, no matter how much we resist change, it's going to happen. Life, work, the world around us is going to change. Without change, yeah. there is no growth, there is no progress, and if you're not, if you're not growing, you're stagnating. So, um, first of all, accepting and acknowledging that change is the norm. As humans, though, we want to resist change with all our might, mm-hmm. and we just want to wrap our Ourselves in a cocoon of sameness. But nature, for example, shows us that the way to, to survive is to change. Nature is constantly changing and evolving. Um, we know that in any organization or association, things have to constantly be changing and evolving. When you get rid of what you no longer need, you bring in new information, new energy, new ideas, whatever it might be. So because we're, we're naturally averse to change, we have a tendency to, to fight back and resist it. But as I said, it's going to happen one way or the other. So first of all, when you acknowledge and accept it, what it comes down to you can either resist it and you can just keep treading water to stay put until you become exhausted and drown, or you can go with the flow and you can swim with the tide and say, okay, this Mm -hmm. is where we're going right now. Um, Let me see what this is all about and what I need to do. You know, I know a lot of nurses who have, they've actually, uh, I mean, sometimes nurses have retired early or whatever. For example, when the electronic medical record first came out, nurses who are accustomed to doing paper charts, there were some nurses that just didn't yeah. want to learn how to do that. It was something different. That's it right. was something new. <laughs> and some people actually, they actually left nursing because of the electronic medical record. And here's wow. the problem with that. Ba- and that's just one example. But the problem with backing away from change is change is a natural part of life. It's just part of the evolution mm-hmm. of, of every day. When yeah. we move away from it, we say, no, I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm going to stay the way I am. I'm going to stay where I am. Life and work continues to move forward anyway. So if you stay where you are, you're actually starting to fall behind and fall that's further right. and further and further mm-hmm. out of the mainstream. Florence Nightingale herself said, nursing is a progressive art such that to stand still is to go backwards. And she said Mm -hmm. this over a hundred years ago. And of course she was so right. She's Mm -hmm. even more right today. So um, there's some good things about change. We, we, when we learn new things, we learn new ways of doing things. We actually create new synapses in our brain. That's a good thing. And we learn Yeah, we learn more about our own capabilities. And even though it takes some energy and it can be frustrating to learn new things, once you learn, you just feel so empowered and so energized. Um, You know, I resisted getting a smartphone for a long time. You know, and I mean, this is years ago. I have one for a long time. But I remember thinking, oh, my God. Oh, even a better example. When I started speaking in 95, we were still using 35 millimeter slides and those big clear sheet. Um, uh, transparencies on those overhead machines. Mm -hmm. You you may not remember those, but um, PowerPoint (laughs) became all the rage. And Mm -hmm. I didn't even want to learn how to use PowerPoint. I thought I'm just going to keep using this stuff as long (laughs) as I can. Until one day I said to a a client, and believe me, we're going back years now, but a client said to me, what kind of AV do you need? I said, oh, I need an overhead projector. And she said, oh, she said, I don't know if we still have one of those. And I thought, oh, oh, I felt so out of it. I felt so antiquated. (laughs) So I thought, okay, Donna, time to learn how to use Mm -hmm. PowerPoint and to start using it regularly in your presentation. So, you know, I'm just using that as an old example. But once Mm -hmm. I mastered it and uh, everything, you know, then I was, I was really able to move forward with it. So, you know, we, we can better manage change when we, uh, first of all, when we, we develop what I call change stamina, change stamina is just getting on, on more of a, a solid base where change doesn't throw us all the time. Part of that is building that, that strong inner core, that resilience. A lot of that is making self-care a priority. And we like to pay lip service to self-care, but 
Um, <laughs> self-care, I have a different perspective on self-care. It's not a reward. It's not a luxury. It's not pampering. It's routine maintenance for the body, the mind, and the spirit. It's akin to like eating that. and sleeping mm -hmm. in our life. And it's not self-indulgence, it's self-respect. We are mm, humans, yeah. <laughs> we're not machines, and, and we break. We have a limited amount of energy that we can expend, physical, emotional, spiritual. As nurses, we expend a lot of energy, a lot of healing energy all the time. We have to take time to replenish that energy. If we don't do that, every little thing that changes is going to just throw us for a complete loop. And... Another thing is to, you know, we want to be in that comfort zone all the time. The comfort zone is mm -hmm. where everything is usual and known and expected. And then when we step out of our comfort zone, we have to learn something new or whatever happens. We get, we feel nervous. Nurses say, I feel like I'm standing on thin ice. I feel like a fish out of water. But the comfort zone is a danger zone because when mm -hmm. you're in it, you're not learning. And if you're not learning, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, you're stagnating. And if you're stagnating, not only are you going to be very unhappy and disappointed in your own life and career, but you're not really, nothing's really going to happen in your career. In fact, something um, uh, unpleasant could happen, like you get let go or you you're get laid off or you're told you're not going to get a position that you want, something like that. So just, you know, learning to go with the flow and moving forward, opening yourself up to learning. Um, yeah, it takes some time and some energy, but it really helps to keep, keep you feeling young and alive and energized. Otherwise you get so stale and stagnant and nobody That's wants so to true. be around people like that. Mm -hmm. That is true. so true. It's like taking the limits off because it's so self-limiting when yeah. you keep yourself in that box because of fear to move forward. But yeah, I was, you mentioned being in that comfort zone and, and yeah, I like what you said about that. It's, it's certainly true because comfort zone I is kind a of danger recently, zone. Yeah, it is. And you do become kind of miserable there. It seems like a nice protective place and you're shielded and you don't have to worry about anything. Or I think it's so much sometimes a fear of failing, a fear, a fear of disappointing, you know, if you mm -hmm. can't make it or you can't do that thing. But I think most of the time, and I think you had it in a recent post, you know, you, you're not going to know if you can do that thing you've imagined unless you step forward, unless you stretch stretch yourself unless you, you know, reach higher and reach further. I think you said that in, in a recent post I was looking at too. Yeah. And I was like, and that when is you, so true. When you, when you try new things, you find out, uh, first of all, you learn more about it because sometimes mm -hmm. we have preconceived notions that are incorrect. Mm -hmm. You find out what you're good at. You find out what you enjoy doing and you can't find those things out by staying put and just doing exactly the same thing every day. Plus, when you're doing the same thing every day, you're, you're like, uh, you know, the walking dead, you're, you're uh, operating yes. on autopilot. You're just going through the motions and that's not a real existence. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not a good, healthy, vibrant existence. So opening yourself up to learning and, and continuously moving forward is just staying engaged in life. We know today as healthcare professionals that, the, the secret really to good health, or I want, I'm going to say well-being, because we like to use the word well-being these days, because well-being encompasses health and success and happiness more than just health. For well-being, we, we want to stay, we need to stay fully engaged in life until we take our last breath, not until 62, not until wow. 75, not until 83. We want to stay fully engaged. And so you do that by staying open to life and whatever, whatever it might bring your way. For sure. Yeah. yeah it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, you are so inspiring and um, you've had such an amazing career. I was just looking back and um, you are the dear Donna from nurse.com. I just want to know a little bit more about that. How did that come about and what was that experience like for you? Well, that was, um, that was a phenomenal experience for me. And what happened was when I, when I got started in my business in 1995, I read a lot of books. I, you know, I hadn't re run a business before. I had to learn how to start a business. I had to learn how to market a business. I had to learn how to be a good speaker. Um, sometimes people say, I just spoke to a nurse the other day who wanted, she's trying to get a business going. And she said to me, oh, I don't have the business gene. I hear this a lot from people. 
I said, mm-hmm. okay, nobody has the business gene. I said, nobody knows how to run a business until you actually have your first business and you have to learn. So um, I told her how I you know, learned, how I started learning about business and marketing and everything. And everything I read, Once one really smart thing I did when I started my business is I read books by the experts and I took their advice. So <laughs> all of the experts in business and marketing said that networking was the number one thing you had to do. You want to network with people who are already successfully doing what you want to do. You want to network with the power brokers in your industry, the people that you know can uh, make decisions or connect you with people and so on. So I thought, well, who are some of the power brokers in my world, not just in nursing in general, but in career career management for nursing and nursing. It was then called Nursing Spectrum Magazine. Today, it's nurse.com. They were all about career management for nurses. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to one of their career fairs. They were free to go to. And I asked if there were any editors there when I went. Now, mind you, back then, I was, I had really no experience to speak of networking. I was very timid. I was very self-conscious. I didn't have a lot of uh, confidence, self-esteem, anything going on, but I did have a dream and a vision of something I wanted to do. So lo and behold, one of the editors for one of the magazines was there at the career fair. And I met, uh, I met two of them actually that day. And I said, Hey, you know, I'm, um, I'm thinking about doing some seminars for nurses. And they said, well, that's interesting because we were thinking of doing some seminars too. So maybe when you're ready to do that, we can collaborate on something. So I made an important connection and we did wind up collaborating. And I deliberately set out to establish a relationship with Nursing Spectrum, today nurse.com, because I knew there was a lot of synergy, not just ways that they could help and support me, but I knew that there were a lot of ways that I could help and support them with my own expertise and with my work. And remember, I didn't come from a place of confidence at that time. I came from a place of wanting to put together a business that would be successful so that I could continue to do it. So I began then to write for them. And then one day they were apparently having a powwow somewhere. They said, you know, we'd really like to have a a face of someone that our readers could identify with and maybe write an advice column. Who could we get to do that? And because they knew me now, someone in that meeting said, what about Donna Cardillo? And so they called me. They had me come into corporate office talked about writing an advice column. And I was, of course, absolutely thrilled to do this. So this was the first time they had an advice column. So my column was, of course, called Dear Donna. And I initially started to um, take questions online on their website. And I think the first day they opened that up to questions, I got over 100 questions from nurses. Wow. I was supposed to be answering like three a day or whatever. But it was like, <laughs> it was like the floodgates opened, you know, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> nurses had a, a person that they could yeah. ask career questions That's to, great. and I would answer them um, online. And so, first of all, what was so great about that is, you know, I always say to be to become to, to be an effective teacher, you have to remain a student. So I would get I was getting asked questions about all kinds of things, nursing related. Some of them I could answer, some of them I didn't know the answer to. So if I got a question, for example, about something, let's say related to um, becoming a nurse practitioner, if it if it was something I didn't know or couldn't already answer, I would contact one of the nurse practitioner professional associations and I would speak to someone and get that information. And then I would be able to answer that question for that person. And I was learning all the time with what I was doing. It was keeping me writing and writing is one of those skills like speaking that you really want to keep doing on a regular basis to get good at it, to polish it. Otherwise you start to get rusty if you do it, you know, only once or twice a year. And because my name and my face was on their website and then in their magazine, I started to become recognizable in many nursing circles because nurse.com at the time was the most widely read publication for nurses in the U.S. So um, I developed some celebrity status from that (laughs) from that Dear Donna column. And so that was very helpful. It was enormously helpful to me in my business. But I had a wonderful relationship with Nurse.com and Nursing Spectrum for about 20 years altogether. And uh, it just, you know, people still today 
when they see me, they're like, oh, dear Donna, you know, I became known that way. And wow. some people think I still write the column. I haven't written the column in about five years, but they're like, oh, oh wow. people, people even say to me, oh, I read your column all the time. I haven't written. Oh. It. <laughs> um, maybe they, maybe they read the columns that are still, uh, still online, right. but it was, a, it was an absolutely wonderful experience in so many ways. That's and it amazing. all happened from networking that I originated. I'm just putting that out there because you just have to put yourself out there and make these contacts. You never know, you know, where it's going to go. But if you stay hibernating somewhere in a dark corner, nothing is going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, That's a good point. <laughs> so, so with the column, did that, is that what kind of uh, led you to public speaking? I know that you're a certified speaking professional and you were a president of a speaker's organization in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, tell us a little bit about that. And then I also want to hear your funniest story from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. First of all, I started out as a speaker. So the speaking came first. first. Um, I started this business oh. in 95 doing these seminars, these full day, six hour seminars for nurses on career alternatives for nurses. And mind you, I had never spoken for six hours in a day ever until I did my first <laughs> seminar. And I had never start, ha, had a business until I started a business. You know, I didn't like, I wasn't born with that, um, that business gene that that other nurse was referring <laughs> to. Um, these were things that I learned, but I started to do these seminars and then I started to get asked to speak like at a hospital, at an association, whatever. So I was doing the speaking and then the column came that that kind of got added on. But I started speaking when I had a job back in. Um, well, I'll just say a couple of decades ago in a hospital. I got hired as a department director when all this DRG and this reimbursement stuff was changing. And I was in charge of quality improvement. My new boss said to me after I was there only a few months, he said, I want you to speak to the physicians next month at their monthly meeting. And I said, oh, oh, oh I, wow. oh, I said, I can't do that. No, no, no. Oh, I, my said, goodness. I don't, I'm not comfortable speaking in front of a group. I told him <laughs> and I'm too new here. They don't know me. I don't know them. I don't know enough yet. And back then the internet wasn't really hot. This was like in the 1980s where you could just suddenly look something up and become a 15 minute expert on this subject. <laughs> um, so he said to me, I said, no, 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 I can't do that. He said, you will speak to the physicians next month. So he wasn't asking me, he was telling me basically. <laughs> and I tell that story in one of my books that I didn't even mention before falling together. I did mention it. Um, I do tell, I tell that story in the book. I'm not going to tell it. I'm not going to tell the whole story now, but I started speaking not by choice. It was something I was forced in a good way to do by a former um, supervisor of mine. And, you know, sometimes we have to, I, I heard Les Brown, one of my favorite motivational yes. speakers, he said, sometimes you have to believe in someone else's belief in you before your own belief kicks in. Oh, and wow. also sometimes we have to be pushed out of our own comfort zone by somebody else. Um, because if he gave me a choice to speak, I probably to this day would never have spoken in front of a group. But I had to get out there if I wanted to keep that job. And I really did like that job. I really wanted to stay there. <laughs> During that time, I also met another nurse through my uh, involvement in a professional association. I'm a big advocate for joining and getting active in nursing professional associations, get on a committee, run for office, work on a special project. It's such a, a aside from creating community, which you need to thrive in, in nursing, it is a great way to expand your world personally and professionally. So through an association I was involved in, I met a nurse. We hired this nurse to come speak at our annual conference. She was a nurse who was a speaker. And I, had, I didn't know anybody did that. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I said, you mean you travel around and people pay you to speak at events? She said, yeah. I thought, holy mackerel, that is really <laughs> interesting. And so, and here I was doing a little speaking. So I thought, hmm, maybe I could do that someday. But just, I, I had, it was a very frivolous thought that I had. During that time, also, a lot of nurses were coming to me because I was a department director in a hospital, but I was the only nurse in that um, community hospital that didn't report to nursing. I reported directly to administration. Now, that's common today. It was very uncommon at the time. All, the, all, all nurses were, were clumped into the nursing department. You know, there were no, except we, we actually did have a nurse who was a CEO of that hospital, but that was really an anomaly at the time, <laughs> at the time also. 
Yeah, she was probably one of the first nurse um, CEOs there. So, um, so nurses were coming to me for advice and saying, well, how'd you get this job? Well, what else can nurses do out there? And so uh, all these things kind of came together. And I thought, you know, maybe someday I could have a business. I could teach nurses about different career opportunities. But I had that idea for 10 years before I actually broke out on my own, because thinking about it and doing it are two different things. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I was actually at a time in my life, I was actually at a low point in my life. And that's important to note too, because people meet me today and they assume I was this person they see in front of them mm-hmm. today. Um, and I said, hey, I'm going to start a business. It wasn't like that at all. I was at one of those pivotal moments in life. I was, um, I, I was at a, a birth date milestone. Those you know, 10-year decades cause us to reflect on where we've been and where we're going. And I was at one of those milestones. I was actually turning 40. And I thought, you know, um, I don't know what my next move is. I don't really know what I want to do. I've had all this experience. Um, I wasn't, I, I, I just didn't really know what to do. But actually, I did know what I wanted to do, because I had that idea rolling around in the back of my head. And I said, uh, you know what, oh, and at that time, nurses were start in the 19, early 1990s, Nurses were getting laid off from their jobs for the first time in the history of our profession. That had never happened before. Hospitals were downsizing and merging like all of corporate America, and nurses were being let go from hospitals. And they were like, what, what, what do I do now? Where do I go from here? So oh, I wow. thought, if I, don't, if I don't bring this seminar out there now on other career options, somebody else is going to do it, and I'm going to kick. So there was a need. But I said, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And I don't want to live with regret and be on my deathbed and say, wow, I could have been the career guru for nurses, but somebody else did it instead. (laughs) Exactly. Well, that's that business mindset, recognizing where there's a need for something and knowing that you have some sort of a skill or something that you could bring to fix that. Well, I hoped. Um, And and you you just never know. And it works. There's no guarantee. (laughs) But you know, an important lesson I have learned is, and and what one of you mentioned the fear of failure or whatever, the real power is in the doing. It's not in the outcome. Um, I said, you know what? I'm going to try this. And if it doesn't work, then at least I know I tried. But Mm -hmm. if I don't try, I'll always wonder what would have happened if I did try. Yeah, that's an important important thing to the power is in the doing not in the outcome wow hmm. I love that. i'm writing that down yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be a post-it <laughs> note, it's gonna be a post-it note. Yeah. <laughs> wow we're gonna have a million donna donna post it i know <laughs> I have a post-it wall in my background. I don't know if you could see it. It's by my TV. I have all my like little things. Oh, good, in good. It. <laughs> so Donna, and being, you know, that nurse guru, um, what have you found to be a challenging aspect to that? And also, um, what have you learned? And, and, and also, what would you consider the most interesting, non-traditional job that you've come across from, from others or from yourself? <laughs> Well, first of all, I don't know where to begin with challenges. The year I decided to start my business, I made the big decision and the big plans to start the business. My husband was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis Mm -hmm. and this all was happening around the same time. And I thought when, when he was diagnosed with MS, I thought, okay, do I need to like scrap my plans and go get a regular job where I'm going to get a paycheck and I have benefits Um, And I took like two weeks of soul searching and I decided to go ahead with the business anyway, with his blessing, fortunately. I'm not sure he was really um, feeling good about me starting a business, but he at least acted like he was. Um, I thought, again, I had that sense of having to try it. I thought, you know what, if it doesn't work out, whatever. But we've had to make a lot of changes and modifications and whatnot over the years based on what's happening with my husband. Um, lots of other challenges. I mean, he initially, he, he wasn't able to work after a short time. We were a two income household with a mortgage, car payments, uh, putting kids through college still, I think. I'm not sure if it happened then or later. Um, and so then I be- suddenly became the sole support of our family. And we, our income was way down. We had to, you know, do the best that we could where we were. And there have been many, many, many other challenges along 
along the way. Um, we had, you know, 9-11 happened in 2001 when all businesses took a huge hit. Then we had a major recession so many years after that. My, the speaking industry just collapsed. Nobody was hiring speakers or doing anything. Then we had a, a major pandemic that lasted a whole two years. So there've been a lot of personal and professional and professional and global challenges, but that's just part of life. And uh, you have to anticipate those things and you, you always have to have something else going on or have another plan or think of another um, creative solution. So, so, so those have been some of my challenges along the way. Then what were, uh, you asked me two other questions in addition to that. Yes, um, I, I wanted to know what was, um, you know, the most interesting non-traditional nursing job that you've come across in your time. You know, um, I've been thinking a lot about that um, because we we discussed that previously that you were going to ask me that. And I don't know that I can pinpoint one because there are just so many. But for example, nurses, most nurses know that many know that nurses work in prisons because they have a health clinic or whatever there. But um, there are nurses who are prison hospice nurses. This is just an example of something unusual that I didn't even know existed until I met a nurse who worked in hospice in a prison because there are um, some inmates who are in hospice, but they need to stay incarcerated. And so they are prison hospice, prison hospice nurse. There are mm -hmm. nurses that work for regulatory agencies for their state, for both um, elder care services and child services that investigate cases of neglect and abuse on a on a health and well-being level. There are nurses that show up every time there is a roller derby in a roller derby stadium and are taking care of um, you know anything that happens to anybody that's there. there there's just mm. an endless list of interesting things that nurses are doing. And there are um, a lot of nurses and even nurse practitioners who are the primary care providers in some very, very underserved communities. There was that wonderful story on 60 Minutes years ago about the two nurse practitioners that have the big RV and they go into Appalachia and other underserved areas and uh, take care of the health and well being of people there. There's just endless, endless stories of unusual and interesting things that nurses are doing out there. There's just so many. Um, those are just a couple that, that come to mind right off the top of my head. And a lot of nurses are writers. They're speakers. I heard a nurse once who said, oh, I would love to write, but nobody makes a living at writing. I said, well, I make part of my living at writing. And there's lots of people that do. Yes. Right. Um, the nurse who said, I'd love to have a business, but I don't have the business gene. We just uh, automatically think that we're, we can't do certain things, but where there's a will, there's a way, you know, you teach yourself, you rub elbows with people successfully doing that thing. Uh, just amazing. Love that. Donna, yeah. you do you do so many different things, and I love that about you. I always uh, I talk about that a lot on our podcast. Um, I think we're the four of us. One of the things we have in common is we really enjoy hearing people who do a lot of different things. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not just in just this one line. We because I don't think any of the four of us are either. We're all kind of making our way. Yeah. Um, and with all the side hustles and things that you do, how do you keep your life? What are some of the practices that you do to keep your life in balance? How does it, uh, how do you keep it from becoming overwhelming? So first of all, I had to almost burn myself out about six years into my business. Sometimes we have to um, scrape bottom before we can start reaching for the top. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have to lose ourselves before we can truly find ourselves and the first six years of my business with my husband getting sick, starting the business, I actually got back into grad school. I wrote my first book. I was president of a 140 member association. I started a caregiver support group. I know, crazy. Oh my, oh my um, gosh. Plus, we, plus we moved because we had to move out of a two-story house to a ranch because of my husband's disability. All I was doing was doing, you know, I mm. talked about that self-care thing, and I was not taking any time. For myself, I woke up one morning and I realized I was I was almost completely burnt out. I wanted to get on a plane and fly to Bali 
and not leave any forwarding address. <laughs> Fortunately, I had the presence oh. of mind to realize that I was in crisis. I was, that was a crisis moment for me. Wow. I could have done, I could have left, I could have gotten on a plane and left and ruined my life and everything I had worked for. Um, or I could have, you know, or I could have gotten sick. I realized that was another option. If mm. I was on, stayed on the path I was on, I thought I'm either going to do something I'm going to regret, I'm going to get sick or who knows what's going to happen. So I had the presence of mind to realize that I had to change something. And one of the things I did at that time is I joined a local gym. We had just moved. And I always joke that, you know, I said I joined a gym. I didn't say I started working out. The, the, reason, I joined, the reason I joined the gym is that they had a jacuzzi in the ladies' locker room there. Oh, and I great. thought, oh, my gosh, I could, like, go over there and lock my phone and everything in the locker and just sit in that jacuzzi periodically. And I already felt guilty at that. Great time. idea. <laughs> really, right? I felt guilty at that time doing anything for myself with my husband getting more progressively disabled, even though he was he was very independent when he was home. He was already using a wheelchair, but very, very independent. But still, you feel guilty. I felt a little less guilty going to the gym. Um, and around the same time, a friend of mine who is an, an RN and a personal trainer, she gave me a book called The Power of full engagement. And I'll tell you, that mm. book really changed my life. That was one book that changed my life. The authors talk about how everybody's living a crazy, busy, fast paced, stressful life. This was before the pandemic. But that what we're do what most of us are doing is we're pushing, we keep pushing ourselves, because we think I, I have to work more, I have to get caught up, they say, you're never going to get caught up, just face that that's not the nature of our life these days. They said, but you have to periodically disengage or pull back. For, that could be for minutes in the day, hours, your time off, longer for vacation. You have to periodically disengage to rest, refresh, and recharge your batteries so that you can more passionately re-engage. That mm -hmm. when you only push yourself without those periods of disengagement, you think you're getting more done, you're actually getting less done, you're making more mistakes, you're making poor judgments, your relationships are suffering, your health is suffering, you're becoming more unhappy. So that book convinced me that pulling back and taking care of myself and taking those breaks and investing in self-care was not self-indulgence. It was absolutely vital to my well-being and being able to continue to do what I do. And I have also, I had periodically done meditation in my life. Today, I do meditate almost every day. I'm also a meditation teacher. I teach mindfulness meditation. I practice mindfulness meditation. Um, I'm currently working out a lot. I've had ups and downs with that, but uh, right now I'm doing it regularly. And I do take time off and away from myself. I go camping. I go tent camping by myself. <laughs> My husband and I used to go camping years ago together. He wasn't able to do that anymore. We I didn't go camping for 25 years because of my husband's oh. disability. And I realized a few years ago, that was a big part of my life. I love nature. I love to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. I love the, the just the challenge of, of camping and everything, sleeping in the outdoors. I realized that was a big part of my life that was missing. And I had to get up the gumption. Oh, oh, so, you know, friends, family, everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, but I can't do it then. So I thought, OK, if I wait for somebody to come with me, I'm never going to go. So I did find some women who camp by themselves all the time. And when I learned that other people were doing it and, you know, they gave me some tips on on different things because I was worried about safety and right. whatever. And keep in mind, I go to state parks. I'm not going to some backwoods, um, back country, you know, right. whatever. Um, so, so that's something else that I do. Camping is huge for me. It's so wow. different. Talk about disengaging. Mm -hmm. And um, I do go by myself. It was a little sad for me to go by myself the first time without my husband, but mm -hmm. um, I love it now. And, you know, fortunately, he's... Um, he lets me go. Of course, he doesn't have any choice, but he knows he knows um, <laughs> he says he lets me go because he knows how important it is to me. And he knows that I'm going to come back better and rested and refreshed. He's a smart man. He's a very, very smart. Yes. Happy so. wife, happy life. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> and I run retreats for nurses today. And the retreats, 
uh, there's self-care for me also, because I'm at the retreat center. I love running the retreats. I do a retreat called Empowered Nurse Enlightened Life. I do them at some really luxury resorts like Miraval and Canyon Ranch, but I also do them at some beautiful um, lower key retreat centers such as Himalayan Institute and um, in the Pocono Mountains and places like that. That's self-care for me too, because I get such joy from that. I do spiritual reading almost every day. I read um, inspirational day book. My, one of my favorites is the book of awakening by Mark Nepo. I um, set an intention almost every day. An intention is how you want your day to go where your intention goes. Your energy flows. I set an mm -hmm. intention of either self-love or gratitude or joy. I set an intention um, every day. So I have my morning ritual, even if it's only five minutes, usually it's longer, but sometimes it's, if five minutes is all I can spare, that's what I do. And I practice gratitude. Gratitude is an enormous part of my life. And my husband and I decided years ago, this is important. When we had all these losses with his illness and disability, we said one day, finally, we said, you know, we could either focus on our losses or mm -hmm. we could focus on all the gifts that we have. And we decided on the latter and we make that choice every day. And we made a conscious decision to live in gratitude. And that's how we live our life today. Well, that's so good. That's amazing. So good. Inspiring. Yeah. And you, you just mentioned my next question. You provide so much inspiration for the nursing community. Um, what it, one of the things you do is provide the nursing retreats. Do you have any nursing retreats coming up? I do. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I have, I just did a retreat in um, at Himalayan Institute in the Pocono Mountains a couple of months ago, but I have another retreat coming up in September at Canyon Ranch in Lenox, Massachusetts, oh, in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains. And this will be my, I've, I've personally been to Canyon Ranch to speak uh, as a guest speaker on several occasions. This will be the first time I'm bringing a nurses group up there. They're very excited to have us. Everywhere we go, this nursing group of mine, people are so happy to have us. They love us. They thank us for our service. Um, they just love having nurses around, which is just so lovely. It's just so absolutely wonderful and lovely. And we spend time together with a lot of different um, activities and different things, but there's plenty of free time to enjoy the resort or the retreat center where we go as well. And all that information is on my website at donnacardillo.com. Really complicated web address, donnacardillo.com. Yeah. Ladies, I think that we need to uh, do this. Uh, hello. Training. Yeah. Right? Hello. Right? <laughs> Open spots. Yeah. And you might uh, meet a lot of people for your podcast too, because we get a lot of really interesting nurses who come, I mean, from all backgrounds, but some incredibly accomplished nurses. Uh, it's just amazing. And then just spending that time together with other nurses is a huge part of the joy uh, of being there. Also, sometimes we have a campfire. I mean, it's just all kinds of great things that we Sounds do. So beautiful. And really, really yeah. important right now, especially for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's what, what I need. What dates guys. did you say that was? Um, well, I don't have the date right in front of oh. me. But it up, is, yes, it is in September. Oh, well, we want to tell everybody. So let's Let me see. see. No, I don't think I have that right in front of me right now. So is it a weekend? Is it's it a week? weekend? It starts Thursday oh. evening and it ends Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Yeah, I can't believe I didn't come prepared with that. That's, oh, that's OK. <laughs> we, we will. We'll get the information. Okay, and and thank you. Um, let's see. I, I have your I'm on your website. Nursing the future is ours. Wait, that's not it. No. Uh, it, what page are you on there? Um, on the events. events? OK, yeah. right at, up at the top. The retreat should be right up at the top. Oh, there it is. I see yeah. it. September 15th through 18th. Thank you Lenox, so much for that. Thank you so much. Oh, for that. Um, awesome. Empowered. And you have, it sounds like you have some space so we can sign up for that. I do have some space. And what has happened and what happened with Miraval in January is uh, my room block does sell out sometimes. And, and if, and the resort sold out in January also. So I, if they had extra rooms, they might have allowed me to bring more people. But um, sometimes these resorts do sell out. And right now, people seem very hungry to get out and make up for lost time. Mm -hmm. And people are going on trips and doing things that they've delayed for a long time, which is which is great. It's all wonderful. So 
my only point in mentioning that is um, nurses, I always tell this to people, nurses, we're traditionally very last minute people because uh -huh. we never know what the schedule will be or what we're going to be doing or whatever. But sometimes you have to plan a little bit ahead for things. Yeah. And how often do you have retreats? How often do I have them? Yeah. Two or three times a year. So obviously during the pandemic, I didn't have anything, but I had something last September. That was my first one, then January. And now I'll have this one in September. So two or three times a year okay, at awesome. different locations, different geography. Beautiful. We yeah. can put yeah. that right. We'll put a link to that right on our, in our show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need to book ours first, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. grab those spots that. first before you advertise. Oh, right. oh, so, thank you, Donna. Uh, yeah. Besides uh, uh, encouraging us to get uh, jacuzzi memberships, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what what do you what could you say at, when you were new nurse starting out? What do you wish you knew then that you know now? Or what could you sell? What what could you tell the younger Donna? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I would tell the younger Donna, and I tell this to all nurses today, uh, first of all, the opportunities in nursing are absolutely endless. And I think I mentioned this earlier, if it doesn't already exist, you can create it. The other thing that is that I tell new nurses all the time, and I did this without really thinking about it much, there's no one right path to follow in nursing. You have to follow your heart and you really have to go with the opportunities, make nursing mm -hmm. your own. When I, there are still some nurses today who tell new nurses that they have to have two years of med surge experience. First of all, med surge today is not like it was years back. It's, it's as much an intense specialty as any other specialty, but, um, Nurses, we have all different personalities, temperaments, backgrounds. We have a lot of people coming into nursing as a, a second, third, fourth career with very diverse backgrounds, different ages and whatnot. And you really have to go with what you want to do. My first job out of nursing school was in a psychiatric hospital. And a lot of people said to me, Donna, you can't do that. You can't, you can't go into psych right out of school. You'll never get a job in a hospital. You'll lose your skills. I said, I don't think I have any skills just yet to tell you. <laughs> um, and I, I did it anyway, because I was, there was an opportunity and I took it, but I, I, people gave me a lot of grief back then really over things. I did it mm. anyway, but I want every new nurse to know that there's more than one way to get into nursing. I've met nurses who get into nursing specifically to work in public health. Their intent is not to work in a hospital. They wanna get into public health nursing and that's what drives their entire career. That's fine. Hospital nursing is great, but there's so many other avenues. Do you need hospital experience to get started? You know what, you don't. And I know a lot of nurses that don't take that particular path. So every nurse is different. So um, follow your heart, uh, create your own path in nursing. There's no one right path. There are literally endless opportunities and um, just never, never stop learning and growing. Those are, those are really the big things. It's wonderful. Love that. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, okay. So I think we're at the close of our, this has been an amazing interview, but the last question we usually ask is, are there any mentors that you've had um, over the course of your career that have helped you to get to where you are today? So, you know, I always, um, uh, I've asked that question many times. I never really had a mentor per se. And however, there were many people that were helpful to me along the way um, in different ways. Part of the reason I didn't have a mentor is I did not even understand the concept of mentoring. There were probably people along my path that would have been happy to be a mentor to me, but I didn't even know how, I didn't even understand the concept or know how to reach out to them. I've since written articles about that. I write about that in, in my books. Um, but I have occasionally reached out to somebody, like when I started my business, somebody said, oh, you should call um, Laura Gasparis von Frolio, who's a very well-known nurse entrepreneur, yes. very successful and call her and, you know, give whatever. So I called Laura and she got on the phone. God bless her. She didn't know me. And I told her that I was starting this business and with seminars and she does seminars. She gave me a couple of quick tips, which was wonderful. That was terrific. And we subsequently, I mean, we are, uh, you know, still connected today. 
Um, I called that nurse speaker that I told you I hired years ago when I found, uh, you know, learned that nurses spoke. And I called her years later. I found her online and I said, I want to I want to do what you do and can you give me any tips. She gave me a couple of tips. So um, I have met people like that. And then I joined organizations like the National Association of Women Business Owners in the beginning. And there were a lot of women, very successful women business owners. And they weren't, I won't say they were mentors to me, but they were amazing role models because they had successful businesses already. And I thought, wow, you know, if they can do what they're doing, then certainly I can do this thing that I'm thinking about. And they were always, if I picked up the phone to call them because I had a question about something, they were always there to help me. It was a big group. So I always say when there's something you want to do, you want to rub elbows with those who are successfully doing that thing, because that's really where you, that's, that's the company that you need to keep. You need to run, you need to be with people to whose level you can rise up to and who can inspire you and be a role model for you. You need to constantly be in that environment. And it, same thing even with nurse practitioners. And I used to speak to new graduate nurse practitioners at, um, at a university in New Jersey, just to really to help um, new nurse practitioners make that transition from RN to advanced practice nurse, because that's a transition that many nurses um, have challenges with. But um, anyway, just, you know, uh, similar, similar types of things. Um, uh, being with people that are successfully doing the thing that you want to do. If a nurse says to me, I'm thinking about becoming a nurse practitioner, what do you think? I say, what, what I think is you need to find some nurse practitioners who love what they're doing, who are successful at it and call them and do an informational interview with them and learn about the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs, um, and all of those things, and then hang out with them. Very, very good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> thank you so much. Th- thank you so much for joining us today, Donna. And uh, for me personally, you were the the voice I needed to hear right at the right oh, time for me oh, today. I'm thank struggling. you so much. Yes. I'm so glad, so, I'm so glad uh, to hear that. I feel very Absolutely. inspired and lifted. Uh, so thank you for that. Yes. My pleasure. So, yeah. We originally, we did see you. I think we I think you spoke at this. We had met Laura Gasparas von Frollo uh, many, many years ago when we were we were all RNs uh, undergrad together. And somehow, I don't know if one of our instructors told us about her. Do you guys remember? Oh, no, it is. Yeah, always it was. I think it was Jill Cook. Was it Jill? It was Jill. I said Jill. Yeah. yeah. I think she mentioned her, and we contacted her because we wanted to do something for. We had a special project we had to do. Right. And so we decided to, we reached out to her and she took, she, ele- she, she paid for the four of us to stay in a hotel. Was it the Taj Mahal? We went yes. To the Taj Mahal. <laughs> isn't she, isn't she unbelievable? <laughs> yeah. In exchange for helping her, like we had to just like, I think we just took registration. Like we did whatever she needed us. Right. Uh-huh. We all just kind of, but we were able to attend her, her, I think it was CCRN. Um, mm-hmm. Review course. Yeah. 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 For free. And, you know, we could stand, be in the room and listen, and then we would help her like in between sessions or whatever. But I I think that you were there. That's in my recollection. That's when you came on my radio. I have spoke. I spoke at a couple of her conferences years back. Yeah. Yeah. So So that um, might've been it. Yeah. This is probably what? Oh, two or oh, three. No, 2007. Just six. Oh yeah. 2007 maybe. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Look at wow. this. We would have never imagined having Donna on our podcast. <laughs> it's it's you never great. Know. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. wonderful. Well, you, yeah. You've done so much for so many nurses and oh. certainly, and, and for us too, we're just so thrilled to have you and feel oh, inspired you. by you. Thank Truly. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my yeah, joy and honored. pleasure. And, uh, you know, kudos to all of you for doing the podcast. I, I you know, I might've mentioned earlier that I, I have hosted a podcast myself in the past. I know how, what a commitment it is, how much work is involved <laughs> pre, during and post, you know, and, um, but it's great that you're interviewing different nurses and talking about different topics and providing that information. That's great. Yeah. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. We, uh, okay. you're super inspiring and thank you for what you do for all nurses. It's, um, oh, so imperative what you do. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's my joy. Thank you for listening. Foreign Peace Podcast has a Facebook group called Nurse Business, a community created to support one another and enjoy positive ideas and thoughts 
We hope you'll join us. In addition to that, for a little fun, follow us on TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see some clips of our live interviews and listen to past episodes. Feel free to email us with ideas for episodes, comments about our podcast, to recommend an interviewee, or if you'd like to be interviewed yourself at 4npspodcast at gmail.com. That's the number 4, npspodcast at gmail.com. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 4NPspodcast. That's the number 4, N-P-S-podcast. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast and go to our website at 4NPspodcast.com for episode transcripts, resources, and more information about us. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. We found Donna to be very inspiring and we learned so much from her. We hope that you are able to join us for our next episode in a couple of weeks. It's going to be a little bit of a different format um, where we're going to all sit down, the four of us, and talk about our experience over the last year with starting the podcast, starting new jobs. We'll talk about our favorite episodes and just have a really good time um, reminiscing over the past year and what we've learned and, um, you know, what we've gained from this experience. So we hope that uh, you're able to join us and uh, thank you so much for joining us again. We really appreciate all of you. Um, Don't forget to check out all of our social media sites um, and don't forget we have that YouTube uh, site um, and please like and subscribe. All right again have a wonderful week and um, we'll see you in a couple weeks. The information in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be used in substitute for professional care by a medical provider. The information in this podcast does not represent medical or other professional advice or services. The thoughts and opinions presented on the 4NPs podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent those of their employers.